Welcome to the Hispanic Heritage Month Roundtable. My name is Gustavo Torres, Director of Youth Advocacy here at the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Today's discussion is part of our campaign for the Cultural Culture Series, an initiative focused on uniting, empowering, educating, and engaging people of color and other targeted communities around critical health care and human rights issues connected to tobacco use. I am joined by a dynamic group of folks dedicated to advancing health justice initiatives within their communities. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's panelists. We're going to be joined today by Dr. Elena Rios with the National Hispanic Medical Association, Marcela Gatian with the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, Gabriela Perez with Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes. She's a volunteer and the founder of Meaningful Exchange and Shared Learning Consulting. Patricia Sosa with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, Sandra Carvalho with the League of United Latin Citizens, otherwise known as LULAC, and Rosendo uh, Iniguez with the Latino Coordinating Center for a Tobacco-Free California. And lastly, but not least, uh, Yelena Aguilar with the Latino Outreach um, support with our Phoenix Flavors campaign. So today we're really gonna talk about uh, the toll of tobacco within the Hispanic community uh, and, and really dive deeper into what tobacco use looks like within our communities. Um, how the tobacco tree has continued to target Hispanic communities um, throughout, uh, throughout time. Uh, also diving into some of the resources that are available to stop kids from starting to use tobacco products and help tobacco users quit. Um, lastly, we're going to really discuss what policy initiatives we can put in place to stop youth from smoking and use uh, from starting to use tobacco and help adult users quit. Um, so with that, let's dive a little bit into tobacco use within the Hispanic uh, community. Um, so I wanna direct my first question to Dr. Elena Rios with the National Hispanic Medical Association. So Dr. Rios, could you tell us a little bit more about how um, the impact of tobacco use in the Hispanic uh, community um, and what are some of the, the health effects um, that we're seeing? And Happy to be here. And uh, the National Hispanic Medical Association, uh, you know, everything we can to help improve the health of Hispanics that are underserved. Uh, and I'll just say Hispanic, Latino uh, is used interchangeably, interchangeably at Latinx now too. Uh, and I think from the perspective of data, I'm going to just quote some of the data from CDC just to set the context. You know, tobacco use is used in different ways. And for the Latino community, CDC has the latest data that says only about 1.3% of people who use tobacco actually just use tobacco straight, you know, uh, in, your, in your mouth, right? Uh, cigars are used by 3.5% of Latinos. Cigarettes, 16%. And I don't have the percentage here, but they're missing uh, the vaping <laughs> and nicotine given by through vaping, which is a very large uh, group now, especially in younger kids that I think the panel should discuss. Uh, in terms of foreign born versus US born, more US born Latinos smoke than foreign born. That's important to think about when we talk about immigrant health. Uh, and also, you know, we're a very uh, heterogeneous group. And according to CDC, the highest ethnic group within Hispanics that smoke the most or use, I'll say use tobacco the most are Puerto Ricans at 29%. Cubans right behind 20%, Mexican Americans at 19%, and then Central South Americans even less at 15%. Now this might be related to exposure to other family members. You know, we have traditional and my grandparents smoked. I mean, they lived to be 95, but they smoked cigarettes. Uh, I, think, I think so traditional family uh, values and smoking, just socializing uh, has, has continued in our communities uh, and celebrations. We have lots of celebrations where people socialize. Uh, so, so anyway, the, the, I think the other, the other thing that you asked me to talk about was really the health impacts. And we know that smoking is the number one risk factor for heart disease. And heart disease is the number one uh, cause of death in the whole country. 
Now for Latinos, the number one cause of death is cancer. And I think if you think about smoking and cancer for Latinos, it's, it's oral cancers. It's your, your tongue, your throat, uh, you know, cancers around the mouth because of the tobacco. Um, in terms of the other, uh, you know, the other cancer uh, strokes and vascular problems, they, they relate to heart disease. They're the complication later on. Uh, but I think, I think that's the major way to look at it, that smoking really does contribute to premature death, dying younger than you would have if you didn't smoke. And, and I'll, I'll just stop there, Gustavo. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And, you know, first, I'll, I'll acknowledge that 18.9% um, of Hispanic high school students currently use e-cigarettes. Um, okay. And this number is, while second to, um, to white students, um, it is, you know, above uh, African-American Black communities in using e-cigarettes. So I think um, this, again, is why having these discussions is so vital and really um, zeroing in on some of the stats and facts as we're looking at how our communities are specifically impacted and then the intersectionality of other cancers and other issues that get exacerbated by tobacco use. Um, you started to touch on one thing that I found that, that I always find very interesting and starting to explain to people that I want to pivot this next question over to Marcella. Um, but we know Hispanic populations are o uh, often overgeneralized. Um, and there's a lot of diversity uh, uh, of use within our communities. So how important is it to develop tailored culturally sensitive approaches to tobacco prevention and cessation efforts? Okay, thank you, Gustavo. And just had to follow up to what Dr. Rios mentioned about the difference in tobacco use, um, and commercial tobacco use among Hispanic subgroups. That's one of the most important issues that need to be addressed when it comes down to data disaggregation, because unfortunately, even though it has improved, we still have numbers that are still like several years old that doesn't really show the current picture uh, when you look at tobacco, you know, commercial tobacco use in Hispanic communities, so, uh, especially among subgroups. So that's one area that needs to be addressed, first of all. And then when it comes down to um, how to uh, uh, work with communities to, to maybe have an impact in terms of educating the communities, providing the resources, providing the right information, so they can actually, um, uh, we can have an, a, a better outcomes in terms of health. And we do prevention for cancer, we do prevention of other many chronic diseases that are um, the result of smoking. So definitely um, creating messages, working with the community. And first of all, working with community agencies and working with community um, health workers, promoters de salud, those are key in, if we really want to get to the community. And especially we want to work with different communities around the country. Uh, you know, how diverse again is our community. You know, some, some areas uh, have probably people that are higher numbers from Mexico, or from Colombia, from Venezuela. So we ne definitely need to take that into consideration when we um, uh, address uh, commercial tobacco use prevention and also making the messages that are meaningful and you know, translation is not enough. We need to adapt the messages. We need to incorporate culture. We need to incorporate the value, uh, the values that are actually um, supporting of, of good health behaviors. Um, and then also, uh, um, you know, it's, it's all um, incorporating the respect um, that is part of our, our values in the culture also. Um, and also looking at um, uh, trying, I mean, not trying, not developing evidence-based interventions that are based in what we have learned in the community. Because that's another key fact, there are that many uh, interventions that can be implemented with Hispanic communities. So that's another important factor. And also, um, like I mentioned before, um, um, working with the community agency and taking advantage that, you know, among Hispanics, they are highly motivated to quit. I mean, when you look at the numbers of secession, like over 60, almost 70% of Hispanics report that they want to quit. They just need the support from the system, from the community. And also, you know, they have motiv they're motivated because they think about their family, they think about their kids. So that's another thing that we need to take into consideration. Yeah, thank you so much, Marcela. I think, you know, a good friend of mine, Julia Mejia, for a city councilor in Boston, you know, always says all means all, right? And, and when we think about working within the Hispanic Latino communities and understanding the vast differences, you know, geographics, but also, um, you know, where people, uh, their, their family cultures, et cetera. It's so important that we really do look at those 
culturally tailored interventions to really help address commercial tobacco. Um, so Gabriela, I want to, you know, kind of turn it over to you as a, a parent, um, founder of Meaningful Exchange and Shared Learning Consulting, um, you know, you're really engaged and involved in your community. Um, as we know, e-cigarettes are the most used tobacco product by Hispanic youth. Um, and I know that e-cigarette use in your family led you to getting involved in this issue in tobacco control work. Can you share a little bit more about what motivated you to get involved in the fight against big tobacco and what's attracting young people and kids to e-cigarette use? Thank you. Um, I appreciate the campaign for Tobacco Free Kids for coordinating this, organizing this. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, you know, I think a couple things. Uh, being involved and a concerned mother of um, two young daughters, um, as a parent, you do worry about the health um, of your kids. And I think when both of them started uh, experimented with, experimenting with vapes, thinking there is only water in them, that really prompted me to really become involved, become informed, and, and really just supporting them in this idea that, yeah, maybe you're curious because somebody else is using it and, and you're trying things, you're experimenting with things, which could be... Uh, could be the start of like getting hooked, right? Like getting hooked on nicotine. And so becoming informed about the health effects on the developing brain of the young person, in this case, my daughters, really motivated me to raise awareness about how parents can become a trusted adult in the life of a young person to help them resist tobacco, to help them um, understand the health effects, to help them decide that they, that they can um, you know, be empowered by their own decisions. And so becoming a parent volunteer with Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes really has allowed me to learn about the intentional and targeted marketing practices that big tobacco use to hook our kids which, you know, uh, the, of course they want, Big Tobacco wants our young people to become users early on because they will be customers for life. And so I, and, you know, as um, Dr. Uh, Rios explains, you know, this could lead to life-threatening illnesses. And so def definitely that knowledge motivates me to really do the work uh, with other families. Um, and I think in terms of knowing what young people have to say about challenges they're experiencing in the schools and in the community is a, is a reason why I believe that also uh, motivates me to understand the need is there. Young people are crying out for help. They need supports. They need, um, they need our help. Right, they need the the help of parents, the help of other mentors, other coaches, uh, teachers. They need everybody to be there for them. And I think um, going back to this idea of why young people maybe get into this mode of experimenting with tobacco products is, it could be boredom, it could be lack of exercise, mobility, and activity. I remember when I lived in Mexico, I used to walk the, the neighborhood and I, that's all I did, walk, run, play outside. Once I came here, it was all about staying home and really riding a car. So there, my mobility went out the window. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Stress and anxiety is, is typical, of course, for young people. Um, they're experiencing a lot of peer pressure to fit in, uh, they're experiencing seeing a lot of stress and anxiety with making grades and, you know, uh, pleasing teachers, pleasing administrators. There's a lot there um, that our young people cannot really explain and communicate directly to adults, but it, it, it's there. And unless you're really observant and listening to young people, you can understand a lot of what they're going through. Uh, lack of support by at least one trusted adult in their life in the home can be something that is missing. And, um, and it could be a trusted adult from home, school or community. Social media is a big one in my opinion. And I think that um, that's one thing that at PAVE, we try to raise awareness with families is that big tobacco knows where to show up for young people. You know, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, um, 
TikTok, all of those places, they know exactly where to put out the announcement so that young people can, can see, oh, this is a cool person with a vape. Hey, I should do it too. Uh, and then the biggest thing, I think, curiosity, like our young people are very curious and um, yeah, they just wanna know what it feels like or you know, why is it cool to hold a device or to kind of just do it. And so there's, there's a lot of reasons. And I think the biggest thing is to, to really observe and, and be ready to have that conversation with the young person to allow them to express themselves and have a voice and really allow them to take control of their own decisions, right? Like I, I, I learned early on that I cannot tell my daughters, don't do that, it's bad, bad for you. I, I need to be in the background and allow them to really uh, empower their own thinking, their own ability to make um, a, a mindful decision for themselves. Got it. I, you know, one thing that you mentioned, um, there's actually a couple, uh, all of it is just really on point, on par, goes back to, you know, that the community, whether it's in the home, whether it's, you know, their peers, whether it's within um, the school environment. Um, and one big thing is, you know, you, you mentioned listening, right, is we need to listen to our young people um, to really understand their experiences and then figure out how they are navigating those experiences. Dr. Rio said in the very beginning, you know, young people, the adolescent brain is still developing, right? Um, so, you know, nicotine impacts the developing brain as well. Um, you know, and then the lifestyle branding on social media is, you know, ha has really been an issue that I think we've all, we've all seen and if it, it experienced um, here in the U.S., but it's also, you know, things that are happening across the globe as well, right? So with that, I kind of want to, you know, turn it over to Patricia to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the landscape of tobacco control outside of the United States, um, understanding that we've been really talking a lot about what we've done here in, in the U.S., really understanding how the Hispanic community is being impacted, but what's going on globally in tobacco control, yeah, uh, well, I think that many of you probably are familiar with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is a treaty that was negotiated and is now coordinated um, by the World Health Organization and what is also known as the FCC Secretariat. And speaking uh, as director of Latin America and the Caribbean, I follow very closely the implementation of this treaty and support the implementation of this treaty in the region of the Americas. And we are one of the regions uh, with the highest levels of ratification, uh, documentation of the effectiveness of the policies that the countries have adopted. Um, and, and so it's a, overall a success story, um, but there's a lot to be done. And many of the things that you're describing are exactly happening in the rest of the world and particularly in Latin America. But what we do see is that many of the countries in Latin America, for example, Mexico have much uh, lower smoking rates, uh, particularly among women and young people than the United States. And that the vaping sector, for example, market and the consumption of these e-cigarettes are much lower in those, in those countries. So that's why you see uh, when they first uh, come to the United States, lower consumption rates, because they come from countries in which culturally that is particularly among women, not acceptable behavior. So part of the assimilation for many of these kids is smoking. Uh, particularly, for example, kids that come from Central America, Mexico, the contrary to kids that may come from Argentina, Chile, or Uruguay, because these are the highest smoking countries in the region. At the same time, they are the countries that have adopted the most aggressive policies. And different from the United States, for example, uh, in uh, Brazil and Argentina, they ban e-cigarettes. They're still there in sort of the illegal market, but overall they're banned and they're not encouraged at all as concept to be consumed, they cannot market this product. So it's a, a very different landscape also because they have a different constitutional framework and laws and they're allowed to do more than what we've been able um, to do in the United States. But the overall battles in terms of the marketing, in terms of the use of social media, in terms of the use of influencers, in terms of the marketing of Juul and all these e-cigarettes, they're there. They're there because the web is global 
and, and the industry is shameless and they don't care that it's not a legal product in that country, they still market it. And in many of these countries, they're not, they're not illegal to consume, they're illegal to sell and to market. So um, yeah. the battles are global. Um, and so uh, I'm very fascinated listening to you and seeing um, the commonalities in terms of what mothers go through, uh, not only in the United States, but I know the stories that I hear all over the region. Yeah, no, I think that is one of the biggest things, you know, when it comes to the marketing is, you know, we have done so much here in the United States to limit some of, some of the marketing, but there still is so much that needs to be done. Um, and this industry has utilized all of the tips and tricks that they, 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 they've brokered here in the United States and really expanded, um, continue to sell death and disease and addiction across the globe. Um, so speaking a little bit of, you know, tobacco industry and how the tobacco industry has continued to market to the Hispanic community, I want to turn the next question over to Sandra. Um, as we know, the tobacco industry has continued to target Hispanic communities, um, especially young people for decades, um, just like they have other groups. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how and why this is a social justice issue? Absolutely. That's a really great question. Um, you know, we do know that historically tobacco companies have targeted Latinos and other communities of color in their advertisement campaigns as early as the 1980s. Big tobacco companies started marketing uh, towards the Hispanic community uh, because they were deemed uh, lucrative and easy to reach and undermarketed. Uh, this has become a social justice issue for us because Latinos have long faced a disproportionate burden from tobacco related diseases and death. Um, you know, these large tobacco companies are intentionally letting Latinos suffer the negative health consequences related to tobacco use. Barriers such as uh, lack of health insurance coverage and a less health care uh, access to other counterparts makes it less likely that they'll be advised by a health care provider to quit smoking cigarettes or to have access to cessation treatments. Uh, more than 43,000 Hispanics are diagnosed with tobacco-related cancer, and more than 18,000 die from tobacco-related um, cancer in one year. Additionally, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death among Hispanic men and the second leading cause uh, among Hispanic women. So cancer, heart disease, stroke, can all be caused by cigarette smoking. This is incredibly important to us because we definitely want to advocate for our community to have access to that quality health care to avoid this domino effect. Um, large tobacco uh, companies keep profiting off of the Latino community um, and the, the use of uh, their highly addictive and dangerous tobacco products, uh, masking it through incentives, clever marketing, sponsoring cultural events, teams. Uh, and we want to make sure that one, we're bringing that into the light and we're fighting back and making sure that they're hearing us from uh, the communities all the way up to uh, Capitol Hill. So that is why it's very important for us to speak out and make this a social justice issue. Well, I can say that we are so grateful to be able to work in partnership with you all in this effort. Um, the industry is really relentless, truly. Um, and one thing that you, you've mentioned is they, they have put profit over people. Um, and it's about time that we continue to put people over profit um, uh, it, as it relates to this issue. So, Rosendo, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing at the Latino Coordinating Center for a Tobacco-Free California. Um, I'm from California. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, but what are you guys doing to reduce tobacco-related health disparities and kind of improve health equity? Absolutely. Thank you, Gustavo. So briefly, the, the Latino uh, Coordinating Center for Tobacco Free California, of course, we are in California. Uh, we are a program of the California Health Collaborative in partnership with USC and with funding support from the California Department of Public Health Tobacco Control Program. We really are, our main focus is to reduce tobacco-related disparities among the Latino population in California. Um, and we have various methods in which we're starting to do so. I do want to emphasize just a couple of them. Uh, the first one is that we were to provide policy system and environmental changes that is considered to be most conducive to reducing tobacco related disparities. Um, and in fact, we are finalizing what we call the policy platform. Basically, it's a guidebook identifying specific or specific PSC priorities that we feel are going to be impactful that others can then incorporate in and follow to help 
uh, reducing disparities. And once we have that completed, we'll be glad to share that resource to everybody. Um, also, we're working to strive the, the gap in culturally and linguistically appropriate materials. Um, Marcella mentioned the need for uh, materials in our language that are culturally appropriate. And it is somewhat of a challenge because, again, as mentioned, you know, Latino population is not necessarily a homogeneous. We're not necessarily all the same. And even in California, there's differences between people in San Francisco compared to people in the Central Valley, compared to people up in, up in Chico. So what we aim to do as well is we, we field test the materials. We have staff throughout the state in Sacramento, um, in the Central Valley. We have USC in Los Angeles. We have people in San Bernardino. So we, we field test the materials to ensure that anything that's put out, whether it be a fact sheet, a uh, PowerPoint presentation that is appropriate to the population, is appropriate to Latino communities and their language, and is presenting in a way that makes sense and that follows or, or falls in line with the, with the, with the family values, with the, with the culture. Um, we feel that in order to make any change at all, the community needs to be aware, the Latino community needs to be aware. They need to, they, they need to know exactly what is vape or what are the harmful consequences. It's not just water vapor, but there's nicotine, there's carcinogens in these products. The other thing that we also aim to do, which kind of ties into that, is we look to build community capacity. So we do that through various ways, but one of which is we do a leadership development program. Uh, most recently, we actually completed a leadership development program in which we had individuals from both Northern and Southern California, as well as the Central Valley, participate in this program. Uh, we feel that we need to create communities, and so Torres is another great way to do so, we need to create communities that are self-sustainable, that even if we weren't here, if programs didn't exist, there was no funding available, that communities still have the, the ability, the skills to mobilize and make change on their own. And lastly, we also facilitate educational meetings with elected officials. Now, this needs to lobby because we cannot lobby, but to let them know about what's going on among Latinos in their respective jurisdictions with the goal that that would then influence them or encourage them to make change and adopt and or support policies that obviously will be conducive to reducing these disparities. That is just great. So, so much to unpack. First off, um, in the new handbook and resources developed, yeah, definitely please send it over. We'll make sure to, um, to highlight that resource. Um, but you drew on a major thing. We're starting to see the through line around tailored resources and the importance of a one size fits all for Hispanic Latinos doesn't necessarily work. Um, so it's so important to kind of keep that in mind. And really, as we're, we're thinking about the leadership development of our communities, um, that's a critical, critical component for long-term sustainability. But, you know, really building up our community um, to really understand these systems, um, but also be able to navigate and work through systems to create a, a more health justice focused um, world for us all. Um, so thanks for all the work that you guys are doing. Um, it's so great. And I, I continue to want to learn more from, from all the great work. Um, so, you know, kind of thinking again about, you know, some of the resources and guidance that's out there to help prevent uh, tobacco use and helping tobacco users quit. I want to turn this next question over to, to Marcela. Um, can you share a little bit about the resources uh, Nuestras Voices has created to support community education efforts in Hispanic Latino communities? Um, yes, thank you, Gustavo. Um, the, the National Alliance for Hispanic Health Nuestras Voices, Our Voices Initiative, have, has been working to support our communities with um, commercial tobacco use prevention and control, as well as cancer prevention and control information. So as part of the work that we're doing, um, like I mentioned earlier, one of the key areas is that we work with um, community-based organizations at the local level, because you know, as, as we're a national organization, we need to have the information brought to the local level. And these agencies are the ones that are supporting our work um, um, at the community level. So they, are, you know, they help us amplify the messages, they help us with the development of resources, they tell us um, uh, you know, what are the needs that the communities have at the time to address these uh, specific issues. And this is part of also the work that we do to address health equity. I mean, that's the way we go there. We work with the communities. We provide information that is culturally proficient in language appropriate, of course. And then we involve the community so that when they, you know, we're not just going there and tell them, okay, you need to use, you know, tell us what you need. And then um, I'll give you a specific example. Um, you know, as part of the work that we do, we also work uh, with the, the state tobacco programs as well as the state cancer programs, you know, as part of the CDC grant that we have. So we provide technical assistance to these programs so they can better reach the communities. 
And uh, we had a great work um, lately working with the New Mexico Tobacco Control Program in, in the community edges that is working with them um, addressing tobacco use in New Mexico. So we just developed a, a tool specifically in Spanish. We didn't do an English version. We did the tool in Spanish for to be used by um, Promotores de Salud. So they can do tobacco 101 type of education and it can be adapted. I mean, they we use uh, this um, um, really great, beautiful graphics that reflect the community, you know, the art. And, and so it's kind of like tailored, specifically tailored to the community that we're going to be working with. Um, but at the same time, since we did it um, with the, um, the state program, we want to make sure all of the states can use it. So it was developed as a PowerPoint presentation. So anybody can just use some of the slides. They can, because we, for example, we included information on, on tobacco use in New Mexico. So if somebody's going to use it in Washington state, they need to change those slides for you know tobacco use in Washington state. So things like that, that can be adapted to the community, that can be actually tailored to your audience. That's the key issue. And like I said, we did it in Spanish and it was based on the work that New Mexico did about um, to better um, uh, reach and have the community use this um, cessation services in the Tejelo Yaquitlan. It's part of that experience. So that's one area. And also, um, uh, we do. Um, uh, we also have partnerships with, um, for example, the American Cancer Society, the American Law Association, to make sure they also increase the reach to our communities and provide information that is culturally proficient as well. And then um, another thing that we do. Um, you know, we also uh, implement, and this is, for example, the partnership that I have with Rosendo. We had a, 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 a webinar, uh, a training webinar on vaping in youth, and we wanted to profile initiatives at the local level that are being successful in working with youth, for example. So Rosendo was my contact to have a great speaker who talked about what they're doing in San Diego. So the partnerships, you know, networking, collaboration, and, and the colleague Gabriela from PAVE, we also are working with PAVE as well to try to increase the reach to more Hispanic communities. And then one last thing I wanna mention, um, we're also leveraging um, the other initiatives that we have at the Alliance. We have our Get Again Moving initiative, which promotes uh, healthy lifestyles in co at the community level. So we partner with agencies and we, we host um, like a date of a health, like a, similar to a health fair, but it, it goes beyond that. So in addition to the screenings that we provide to the community, they also provide information about you know, exercise and, and prevention. So we include information there that has to do with the tobacco use prevention and control as well as cancer prevention. So again, it's a way to like increase the reach that we have and also make sure everybody's getting as much information as, as, as they have and they have access to the resources that we develop as well. That is uh, just, Truly amazing, um, you know, and looking and seeing some of those resources, um, you know, I, I see so much value. And I think the one thing, again, that I continue to hear goes back to community, right? And really understanding the communities of which we serve. Um, and that means that listening to community and being within community to have these discussions really strengthens our movement um, because then it's led from within, um, which is so truly valuable. Um, which kind of goes around to, to Gabriela talking about the family environment um, exactly. still. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the importance uh, of community as we are helping someone quit, um, whether it's the individual, the family, health providers, um, and what are some resources for kids that may be uh, addicted to nicotine or kind of struggling trying to quit? Thank you. Thank um... you. So I really appreciate all the panelists and your contributions. And I also wanna acknowledge all of the attendees that are you know, listening to us. And I'm sure they're doing their own piece of the work and thank you for that. Um, thank you for caring about our leaders for tomorrow. I'm really concerned about our young um, people. So I appreciate that you're asking these questions because every time I hear the questions, it makes me think of a, you know, what else can be done? How else can we reach them? And it does, it really does take a village, right? It takes every single one of us. It takes everybody in the community, law officers, school resource officers, teachers, mentors, um, our neighbors. It, it really just takes everybody. But I think it also takes uh, the self, like the individual, the young person. Like we need to be able to um, communicate that they're not alone, but at the same time, empower them to be their own best self advocate and their own best um you know we need to allow them to to have a voice 
to, to be that uh, young person that can have a critical thinking for themselves and really make these decisions, these uh, smart decisions for themselves. So I agree that we do need everybody in the community. Uh, and yet, the other thing that comes to mind when it comes to community and, every, and, and all the players, we're all trying to do something to support um, tobacco control. And one, how do we make sure we're coordinating efforts so that we're kind of like going in the same direction, creating momentum, like really supporting everybody's efforts? Because if we're operating in silos, that could be a little tricky and, and, and it's difficult. The other thing that comes to mind as everybody's talking is this idea of how do we know that our communities trust us, right? How do we know that they that they really do trust uh, the school health officer or the the uh, social worker? How do we know that they trust their their health um, agency, their local health agency? Like, how do we know that the trust is there? How do we know that they're that that um, that meaningful mutual trust happens because if this is not established, um, we can do a lot of efforts, a lot of campaigns, and our people are still fearful of some of these systems. And so that's a big thing that comes to mind, especially with immigrant populations. Um, we, we can't avoid but to fear you know, what can happen if social services gets involved and, and my child gets taken away? You know, a lot of these issues are very real for some of our communities. So really keep that in mind. Um, in terms of resources for young people, um, Colorado is really supporting, uh, sp especially we work with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And we're really supporting uh, My Life, My Quit. Uh, for young people because it is a free and confidential service for them. It, and, it, and it's also available in English and Spanish. Um, but before the resources, I think it's important to recognize that a person or a young person, a youth um, must be ready to quit. You know, we, we can't give the resources if they're not ready. We need to also have these conversations way before uh, this cessation comes in place because, again, we're trying to build the trusting relationship between the adult and the young person. So we, we do need to have their permission. You know, are we ready to talk about tobacco? Are we ready to talk about your concerns? Are we ready to, for you to voice what, what experiences are happening, you know, out in community, in school, at the parks? You know, like this needs to take place um, mm -hmm. because, we, we need to know, they need to know that we're there to support them. They need to know we're concerned. And yet it is ultimately their decision uh, to really be ready, it, to, to really engage in this conversation about tobacco control and cessation. And so I, I, my, my belief is that it's so important to allow them to have that voice, to have them lead the efforts. And last thing I, I will say that PAVE, Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes really does a, an awesome job about involving young leaders uh, to really do the work with us. Like, this is not about parents only. Like, young people can go and testify and have their testimony uh, with legislators, with, with those decision makers. Like, they can do that. They can be at the forefront of these campaigns. Um, in the school, they, they are the ones that can um, organize a, a movement to stay tobacco free in the schools. If, if, if we know how to get them on board, if we know how to ask them to really, we need a leader to take this and, and get creative on how do we get the word out? How do we involve more young people way before they get hooked on nicotine? And so there's just so many things that I think our young people can really be the key and how this can be, um, more effective in my in my opinion it's like definitely they, they yeah I, yeah definitely and I, I i say at the the campaign for back for free kids you know the investment in young people um in this fight is so critical you know we always hear young people are the future leaders you know um, young people are leading today these movements and and we're living in their future um in most instances and so really creating those environments is so critical um, but also that if young people aren't ready to quit, 
um, it's so important just to be that supportive voice for when they are ready, because whether it's this issue or anything else, to know that you have somebody that actually cares about you ends up meaning that you are that trusted source, which they'll come to when they're ready. Um, so with that, I, I want to turn it over to Gabriella. Um, you know, thinking, or sorry, Sandra, um, thinking a little bit about, you know, the LULAC is the most widely respected, you know, Hispanic civil rights organization in the U.S. So really, how is LULAC getting involved in tobacco control in this fight? So one of the most pressing issues uh, affecting Latinos is health. Disparities in access, quality of service, and the burden of preventable chronic illnesses are rampant among our community. Cancer, heart disease, stroke, all of which are, can be caused by cigarette smoking are among the five leading causes of death among Hispanics. LULAC is actively working to curb tobacco use among our community through education and outreach events um, and resources, not only aimed at youth, but also just the general Latino uh, population and families. We work with organizations like Tobacco Free Kids to develop content in both English and Spanish and assure that we are presenting relevant information uh, that the Spanish speaking community can fully understand. We've seen that language is a huge barrier within our community. And so we are doing everything that we can to make sure that the information that is reaching the community is something that they can understand and that they can keep sharing with loved ones, with friends, uh, with any acquaintances, because this is truly a, health, a public health issue for our community. Um, oftentimes these communities lack access to the necessary tools and resources uh, due to lack of literature and information being presented in other language, such as English only. Um, you know, we have been working hard to develop a, an interactive toolkit that will be housed at lulac.org slash, slash live tobacco free uh, that really covers everything from situational awareness, key health points and tactics that the community needs to be aware of. Um, as we've seen that tobacco companies seek to appeal to our community through a lot of tips, tricks and, and uh, misleading marketing. Uh, through our Latinos Living Healthy uh, campaign, uh, you know, we, we use that program to raise awareness in communities uh, about the steps that individuals must take to prevent a lot of the illnesses by connecting uh, our community with not only national, state, and local resources, but also being able to address the individual and community change uh, really through our partnerships uh, and through our uh, community coalitions. Um, in addition to that, on the programmatic end, uh, we are also working on the policy end to make sure that we are supporting legislation that will bring that change to our communities. Uh, recently, um, earlier this year, we did sign on, um, you know, to support the tobacco tax and the build, a build, better, build Back Better package. Uh, these provisions will generate substantial benefits to public health by helping pe young people uh, from uh, will help young people from starting to use tobacco products and of course encouraging current users to quit. Um, you know, health outcomes will improve as long as we continue to make concerted efforts at all levels for sustained change. Uh, through our endeavors, LULAC encourages healthy lifestyle choices and ultimately trying to put more Latino families in control of their own well-being. Yeah. That is great. And I think, you know, speaking of policy, this is so crucial, right? Um, especially as we are combating the e-cigarette epidemic. Um, so, Resendo, earlier you were talking about um, policy systems and environmental change. Um, and we know it's so needed to facilitate the reduction in tobacco-related um, disparities amongst Hispanic Latino communities. So can you just speak a little bit to... Um, uh, what policy systems and environmental changes are really needed right now? Absolutely. And, and I will say that these might vary, obviously, depending on uh, the state. Um, we know here in California, there are three specifically that we emphasize as priorities to reduce disparities. No, the first one is smoke-free multi-unit housing. And, and I think smoke-free policies are important in, in all aspects, smoke-free um, outdoor venues, smoke-free workplaces, but specifically here in California, smoke-free multi housing is, is very important. Um, for those that perhaps may or may not be aware, you know, many individuals, even if they don't allow smoking in their apartments, they still are exposed to secondhand, even sometimes thirdhand smoke because of the drifting smoke. 
In California, there are smoke-free workplace laws that prohibit smoking and vaping in enclosed common areas in multi housing facilities, but not necessarily for outdoor common areas. Also, when what happens is here in California, because of the weather, we might have the doors open, and so smoke oftentimes drifts from neighboring units. Also, even if the doors aren't closed and the windows are closed, we know that smoke, secondhand smoke does uh, go through the cracks in the walls, electrical outlets, plumbing, ventilation, and other, other methods, and enter into neighboring apartment units. So we, what we see here in California is that because of the lower socioeconomic status, oftentimes Latinos are more likely than non-Latinos to live in multi-unit housing. In fact, here in California, nearly half of all renters, about 49%, uh, 47%, excuse me, are Latinos. You add the fact that Latino households are more likely to contain children and have an av a, a much larger average household, you're really putting Latinos at risk when you're having communities that don't necessarily protect their renters from secondhand smoke. Um, most recently, uh, several years ago, a street in East LA found that about 97% did not allow smoking in their homes, but yet 80% of them reported having secondhand smoke enter their units within the past year. Um, you know, people oftentimes say, well, people can simply just move and maybe buy a house or go somewhere else, but that's not necessarily the case, especially with the, with the housing market, the cost of living, and also, you, thought, you think about or maybe perhaps our undocumented communities that don't necessarily have the financial means to uh, purchase a home, to have good credit. So oftentimes, they are, they are in a position where they can't, they can't leave. So we believe that everybody should have the opportunity to, believe, uh, to breathe clean air in their apartments, in their homes, this, regardless of how much money they make, regardless of where they live. There have been strides here in California and throughout the country to do so, but we're still seeing a lot of communities that are predominantly Latino that still do not have policies that protect renters from the smoke or uh, also vape, uh, aerosol uh, within, within their apartments. The second is a tobacco retail license. Um, now, in East California, state law requires that all tobacco retailers be licensed, um, but also local communities or local jurisdictions can also have their own tobacco retail license to address any gaps that might exist at both state and federal law, but also to really enforce and perhaps limit both the sale and advertising of tobacco products. Why is this important for Latinos? Well, we know that based on the data, on the data Latino communities and communities of color have a higher tobacco retail density. In other words, there is more tobacco retailers in Latino neighborhoods compared to non-Latino neighbor, non neighborhoods. What this means is this puts, and the data shows, that those that live closer to tobacco retailers are more likely to either initiate smoking at a younger age or continue smoking throughout their, throughout their lifetime. So if we minimize through a tobacco retail license, we minimize access and promotion or marketing of tobacco of products, then we can help prevent future smokers or uh, kids from starting smoking at an early age. And the last, even though it's not necessarily a policy, it's more of a system change, is we need the mass implementation or adoption of a referral process to increase the station referrals among the Latino community. The data shows that even though um, Often, the people who go to the doctor, they oftentimes get screened for things like diabetes and don't get screened uh, for diabetes services. The same should be applied for tobacco and people who smoke. What we're seeing that there's, there's a disparity in the amount of referrals uh, among Hispanics or Latinos compared to non Hispanic Latinos. So, in other words, Latinos are less likely to be asked by the medical provider, medical provider if they smoke and then refer to any type of station service. Uh, so, we need to have more screening and then more referrals for Latinos to, uh, to local cessation services. This would be perhaps really helpful in fairly qualified health centers or FQHCs, many of which serve uh, large numbers of Medicaid or uninsured patients, many of which are also Latino. We also wanna make sure that we provide cessation services in a culturally appropriate manner that is appropriate for the Latino community that is in their language, whether it be Span Spanish or ind indigenous languages. Um, and we also wanna make sure that we put them in safe places you know, some people don't feel safe going to a hospital or a doctor's office to obtain physician services. Maybe we can do them at churches or in their own apartment complex or somewhere where they feel safe and at a time that is convenient for our Latino communities. Those that perhaps live or work in agriculture or construction can't necessarily take time off during the middle of the day to go and go to physician services. They need to be made available at a time and location that is appropriate for the Latino community. And lastly, and quite frankly, this is a, a big gap, is also cessation services for Latino youth. Um, with, the, with the vaping epidemic, we're starting to see more and more kids hooked, and not necessarily just hooked because they like the flavor, 
but physically hooked, physiologically hooked to the nicotine in basic products. And there really is a lack. And um, although there is more, starting to be more efforts for, like, for youth, there has also been emphasis for Latino youth and services for cessation for them. Yeah, that's, again, so vital when we talk about policy ensuring that uh, it's accompanied with uh, culturally tailored, appropriate uh, cessation services as it relates to our tobacco policy work. Um, so, Yolena, let's talk a little bit about um, the work that you're doing with the Phoenix Flavors campaign. Um, so, you've been working on this ca campaign to prohibit all flavored tobacco products. Can you speak to the importance of clearing the market of flavored tobacco products um, and your work in involving Hispanic Latino communities? Sure. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for this opportunity and my colleagues are amazing. Um, they have said and shared so much information that is so valuable for our communities. We know and going back to um, what Dr. Rio said, like in Arizona, one out of six high school students um, are using flavored tobacco and seven out of 10 um, started with um, vaping products. So um, I have seen this not only as, you know, someone working on this campaign, I'm also a parent of a 17 year old and a 14 year old, and I also serve as a school board member. So I get to see this play out in many different ways. And um, what we have been working on on the ground here is ensuring what my colleagues just said that we are reaching out to our Latino community in multiple various ways because it's not just like the letters or hiring the Spanish digital media expert who speaks Spanish and already has like this great outreach with our comunidad and understands and runs multiple campaigns. It's also working through school districts, sending the flyers in Spanish and English it's education opportunities, it's everything that's been mentioned. So you have to work on the ground with the trusted resource, with the trusted sources, which sometimes, and most of the time is our promotoras, working through the FQHCs and ensuring that if they don't have promotoras or that they are ha like hiring them and that they are training them and that we are working together as a coalition. I have had the honor of working with Gabriela Perez who spoke and trained some of the local promotoras here in Arizona. So sometimes you may not know someone locally, but you can find someone nationally. And it is about like building the message and reaching out to our communities that are never receiving these resources. Like they are, Latinos are usually the last people that get to, you know, that get the education part. So if the, the campaigns are, aren't out there, like, strategically reaching out to them. Like you can't reach to every Latino in the state, like it's impossible. So you have to have people on the ground. And I've, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Not only did I get to work with mamas, I got to work with students. And as mentioned, they are the future leaders and they are so smart and they are so aware. They know that when they walk outside of their school and I'm not just talking about high school students, I'm talking about middle school students. I work mostly with middle, middle school students on this campaign. They are aware that they are being targeted. They are aware that they leave, they live in food deserts. They are aware that you know the convenient the gas station is probably where they're going to buy the milk, and that they are being directly targeted. They are aware of all of these issues that are directly impacting them. What they lack is education and information. And it's so eye-opening to talk to them and engage them because they are extremely brilliant and um, they give me hope, but they, they also don't know what is happening to their bodies when they're ingesting this nicotine. And until someone is out there educating, they become aware of these issues that are directly impacting them. So when I was younger in middle school, we didn't have like these instruments or cigarettes, right? And these children, although they have access to the world through technology, they're also not out there researching how this impacts me or what is in, included in this. They're on the social media platforms on TikTok and Snapchat and being directly targeted by these, you know, targeted ads. And that's the way it is in real life as well. So it's working with the, the directly impacted, which are our, our kiddos, our students, 
and educating them and then working with the, the moms. So not only can, so they can advocate for themselves, but they can advocate for their children. And Gabriela said this beautifully, like we have to educate our children so they can self-advocate. Like that is the only way that we're going to be able to move this forward. But it takes so many things. And what it takes mostly is legislation. At the local level, like I, I passed the resolution, but it's a belief system. I can't actually, you know, pass a law like that's up to legislation. And what we need to do is hold our legislators and city council accountable because they are responsible for the decisions that are made. And local control is everything, especially here in Arizona. And we need to hold them accountable with our vote because that's the only way that things are going to change. Um, you may vote for a Latino, but they their values may not align at the end of the day. They may not care about the things that are directly impacting our Latino kids and families because, you know, Big Tobacco has so much money and sometimes they're funding all these campaigns. So we have to be aware that not only does all of this on the ground have to happen, but we also have to use our power, which is our vote, and vote for the right people or hold them accountable like right now. Um, and we're going to be able to vote pretty soon, but we need to ensure that we are voting and encouraging everyone to vote and really voting for the right people because the work on the ground is critical and important. For so, example, so critical. For example, just to say something, you know, I didn't know like until I worked on this campaign that our city council doesn't have a public health expert on staff. They have one consultant. This is the fifth largest city in the country. Yeah, yeah no, the, and, and these are things that we need to pay attention to, right? So with that, I, you know, as we're getting ready to wrap up today's panel, um, I do have another question I would like to um, punt over to Dr. Rios. You know, one of the things we know in recent years, menthol um, cigarettes have increased uh, amongst Hispanic smokers. What are your thoughts on the FDA's decision to move forward with the rulemaking to prohibit menthol cigarettes? Oh, I think it's great. I, people don't realize, I mean, I remember uh, the, the tobacco commercials that came out in the 1970s about the importance of menthol as a new way, especially for women to have a lighter cigarette, like we have diet sodas, right? It, and it really was an appeal to the concept that menthol is something that we get in our cough medicine and our cough lozenges. And menthol is a way to make your, your taste buds and you know think that they're getting cooled off. I'll just use that as a, as a way to think about the taste of a menthol uh, and menthol cigarettes. And what happens is people that smoke menthol cigarettes, they end up actually having a little bit of, um, uh, you know, feeling that they don't, they don't get the, uh, the pressure of smoke, uh, and, and that might not be the right word, but they end up being able to inhale more deeply. <laughs> menthol actually allows you to feel like it's a little easier to breathe. Mm -hmm. This openness uh, in your in your throat and, and your airways, so you end up getting more uh, dangerous chemicals from the cigarettes, menthol cigarettes, than without menthol cigarettes. So, yeah. I, you know, from a healthcare standpoint, it, it's about time people realize that FDA science and experiments now show that menthol cigarette and menthol flavoring is is really bad uh, worse than the regular cigarette we never knew that when it was first advertised the other right. thing i think for it's very appealing to youth because again it's another way of feeling like you're getting a candy type flavor it's another flavor and and um i think all the all the flavors need to be banned actually and yeah. for, i'll just say one last thing is that nhma's uh, foundation National Hispanic Health Foundation. We have a stop vaping campaign with a lot of resources. Uh, and we do have those on our nhmafoundation.org website. Uh, and I just say we worked with, with some of you on this call for our uh, advisory committee. And we did use high school, middle school and high school kids in two focus groups to ask them to review our images. So they, they actually provided some input 
to the creation of the images uh, and uh, also to our videos that were made and they're free is, to use. So thank you. That's great. Um, I love the youth inclusion and the development of resources. Um, so to all of our panelists, I do want to say thank you for taking the time out to have this important conversation with us today. For everyone who joined us, we are so grateful to be able to um, speak in partnership with you all as we continue this, this critical work. So with that uh, said, I would like to turn it over to Patricia Sosa for any last words as we close out. Um, and again, thank you all. Thank you, Gustavo. Um, I would say this is an important topic for our community. I, I told some people earlier that I do all the Spanish media work for the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. And I'm so welcome in the radio stations, most of the uh, news programs, uh, whether they're on television, on online, now there's so much going on online in terms of the interaction with TV. There's a hunger, a hunger for protecting our kids from tobacco addiction. There is an immense hunger and awareness in protecting our kids uh, on uh, the uh, e-cigarettes epidemic, particularly Juul. So your work is fabulous, your work is welcome, your work is really important, and we're very grateful to be collaborating with you at the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Thank, thank you, you Gustavo. <laughs> yes, thank you again all for joining us, and we look forward to continuing these conversations um, with our next cultural conversation, um, which will come out again shortly. So again, thank you all for joining us. We look forward to continuing to strengthen the work within our communities. Bye, everybody.